Um, good evening and welcome to our second edition of Choosing Our Future in Catalonia. Um, some of you have met us already in October, so welcome back tonight. And uh, to the ones who don't know us yet, I would like to present ourselves briefly. We are a group of non-Catalan citizens who live in Catalonia and who are, like all of us here tonight, interested of what's going on in the country that we live in. Call it Catalonia, call it Spain, or call it Europe. Today we will talk about law and legitimacy in the Catalan question. Law and legitimacy is always an interesting matter to discuss. Actually, yesterday, the president of the Generalitat, Atomas, mentioned it in his discourse when he said, I read it first in Catalan, Un estat que dio que no a tot, ni fa, ni deixa fer, juga a atemorir, y confronta la legalidad am la legitimidad, which means a state that says no to everything, that doesn't do anything, but also doesn't let others do, is playing with threats and confronts law against legitimacy. So to shed more light on this subject, we are very honored to have with us two experts tonight in the field of political science and international law. Let me welcome Mr. Klaus-Jürgen Nagel to my left and Mr. Nico Krisch to my right. Mr. Nagel is a professor of political science at the Pompeo Fabra University. He holds a PhD in philosophy that he obtained in Germany at the University of Bielefeld. And he also holds degrees in history and social sciences. The first time he came to Catalonia was in the 1980s to study the workers' movement and the Catalan question at the dawn of the 20th century. Since 1997, he works at the Pompeo Fabra University and his current fields of studies include nationalism, theories and comparative analysis of national movements, pluralism, uh, perdona, federalism, theories, comparison, especially between Germany and Spain, and European integration, such as the role of regions and cultural diversity. Mr. Naga has also published several books, for example, Federalism Beyond Federations, Asymmetry and Processes of Symmetrization in Europe that he published together with Ferran Requejo from the Pompeo Fabra University. And his latest publication is in German. It's called Catalonian from Autonomismus zum Separatismus, which means Catalonia from the Autonomism to Separatism and was published in 2013. To my right, Mr. Krisch, um, let me introduce him to you. He is an Ikrea research professor at the Barcelona Institute of International Studies, and he's also a fellow at the Hertie School of Governance in Berlin. He is working on issues like international law, global governance, and law beyond the state. Before moving to Barcelona with his family in 2009, he was a senior lecturer at, a law, at the law department of the London School of Economics and Political Science, and a research fellow at Merton College in Oxford, the New York University School of Law, and the Max Planck Institute for Comparative Public Law and International Law in Heidelberg. He has also been a visiting professor of law at Harvard Law School. Mr. Krisch holds a PhD in law of the University of Heidelberg and a diploma of European law of the Academy of European Law in Florence, Italy. He has published also books like Selbstverteidigung und Kollektive Sicherheit, Self-Defense and Collective Security, and his latest book, Beyond Constitutionalism, the Pluralist Structure of Post-National Law, was awarded with the 2012 Certificate of Merit of the American Society of International Law. So now let me give the word to Mr. Krisch first um, to tell us his opinion about the subject of tonight, law and legitimacy in the Catalan question. And he will talk about 15 minutes. Afterwards, he, Mr. Nagel will speak. And then we will have plenty of time, at least half an hour, to have a round of questions from the audience. So, Mr. Krish, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much for the invitation in the first place and uh, uh, for having me here. Uh, I very much look forward to the discussion we're going to have afterwards and I'm going to 
try to outline a few ideas and thoughts that I have um, before that. Um, now, somehow, somehow because I'm often in a slightly uneasy position as a lawyer in sort of when faced with questions about the Catalan conflict. Right? Many people come to me and ask, sort of, what, is, what does the law say? And uh, most of them come with a hope that the law says one thing or the other, other thing. Uh, and obviously, I can say something about these things, uh, at least about some of these. Uh, but often, I leave the questioner uh, in a relatively unsatisfied position because I don't give them entirely what they'd like to hear uh, about the, la the law. Um, uh, and that's especially so because the law uh, in sort of questions about uh, Catalonia these days is always only half the story. Uh, and I'm going to tell you in a moment sort of, sort of what half of and sort of how that is. Uh, but to an extent it seems like that the the Spanish Unionists, or sort of the ones that would, don't like Catalonia to be uh, independent, they would like to be the law uh, to be the full story. Um, and the independentists would like the law to be much less than half the story. Uh, and I'm going to tell, a bit about, uh, tell you a bit about uh, how I see the weight uh, and the distribution of that. Um, so I'm going to try to do this quickly and without too much legalese, really. So if anybody has an interest in more details on legal issues, uh, please ask me afterwards. I'm not going to try to go into too many details in that initial presentation. Um, but I'm going to say a few words about sort of what the legal situation around questions of independence uh, are. Um, now, first of all, of course, that has to do with Spanish constitutional law, and I'm not an expert in Spanish constitutional law, but what is clear, even for sort of a sort of semi-specialist, uh, is that obviously the Spanish constitution imposes very tight limits on what can be done. Um, on the one hand, for holding a referendum in the first place, where it assigns, uh, at least according to the constitutional court, uh, exclusive competences to the state and the central government, uh, but obviously even more so for any kind of attempt to become independent where the Spanish constitution provides for the indissoluble unity of Spain uh, and defines uh, the Spanish nation as the nation behind the constitution, others as nationalities at most, uh, and is obviously relatively centralistic in outlook generally uh, compared to other federal structures or properly federal structures, I should say. Um, now, obviously, as I said, so all this is not simply the law, it's the result of a process of interpretation in which the courts, especially the Constitutional Court, uh, have taken a very active stance. Uh, and of course, the law is, as always, not immutable. Um, it's a frame, uh, but a frame that itself could be changed. Um, so, of course, the Constitution would allow a referendum if only uh, the Congress authorized it. Um, uh, and the Constitution itself could be amended uh, if one could gather the two-thirds majority uh, that one would need for that. Um, except, of course, for those parts of the Constitution where even a two-thirds majority in both chambers is not enough, uh, as some of you will know, the amendment process of the Spanish <coughs> Constitution is a particularly difficult one uh, in that if you want to change something about the first few articles of the Constitution that talk about the unity and uh, so sort of very central features of the Spanish state. If you want to change those, you need a two-thirds majority in both the Congress and the Senate. You need new elections, and again, a two-thirds majority in both houses of the uh, Parliament. And then you need a referendum. So that's an almost impossible hurdle to take. So as I said, the law is not immutable, but in practice, the Spanish Constitution, for quite a few very central questions, is almost uh, unamendable. Um, now, if, if Spanish constitutional law doesn't give many helpful answers, obviously, to the independentist cause, international law uh, maybe gives a bit more leeway, but also not that much, really. Uh, it's a bit less restrictive, but at the same time, it doesn't give much of a right, really, to secede or to become independent. Um, there is a right to self-determination in international law, but its external component um, so the right to secede from a country uh, in certain circumstances uh, is very limited and typically thought to be, be confined to processes of decolonization or situations where human rights are massively violated, both of which are difficult to argue 
uh, in the uh, current case here. Um, and even though there's lots of, so at some point I hear kind of quite a few sort of mentions of the International Court of Justice and what it said in an opinion on Kosovo a few years ago, actually uh, the court did, said very little that would be of great help to the independentist cause and sort of the passages that are cited uh, are often, uh, often a bit uh, but taken out of context. Um, the court really tried to get, get itself entirely out of, as much as possible, out of any consideration of the uh, legality or sort of the right to secession in the Kosovo context. Um, and everything that it said, but already that might be something, is that international law is mostly silent on or neutral towards secession. Um, that's an internal matter of states. Uh, international law may have something to do with the consequences when a state becomes independent. So what it, when is it a state? Sort of, How does it come about? What possibilities does it have? What rights does it have? But until that point, international law doesn't tell us that much, really. Um, it stays away from that question. It leaves it essentially uh, to the facts uh, sort of the political processes to sort them out. Um, the third element of law that is often in the discussion is the question of European Union law. Um, and that's largely about sort of what would happen to a new state in Catalonia, of Catalonia. Uh, in the European Union, would it be outside, would it be inside, sort of what happens? Um, now, the situation is not directly regulated in European Union law. Most commentators think that uh, any seceding entity from a current member state would itself be a new entry candidate and would have to apply for membership in the European Union on the same terms, essentially, as, the, as other candidate countries. There are some that think, well, there should be other procedures potentially not involving the longish procedure for getting into the Union, but uh, nevertheless, they would typically require uh, unanimity among existing EU members to achieve accession. So the hurdles are there, nevertheless. Um, uh, for Scotland, there were some so there was quite a bit of discussion about this, but because Scotland enjoyed uh, the support of the UK government, uh, the main the serious questions about whether you need all member states to agree to entry were not really posed as radically as they would be with Catalonia, obviously. Um, all right, so this much as a sketch of sort of the legal situation roughly uh, in, these, in these three layers. Uh, but as I said in the beginning, sort of the law is only really half the story. Um, now, the law that there is, as I said, sort of doesn't really favor m much of an independentist cause. Uh, it somehow stacks the cards against independentism, especially because any action that might take you outside of the law will often be seen as something somewhat suspicious. And that's something that I certainly, when I travel uh, outside of Catalonia to Germany or the Netherlands or the UK, uh, quite a few people fear, well, so this, is, this seems to be all illegal. And of course, so that for many people, it's kind of a signpost that something is going on that maybe shouldn't be going on. Uh, but then, so if the law is not the end of the story, uh, and that's maybe sort of strange for a lawyer to say, um, maybe that suspicion is not really entirely justified. Uh, as most lawyers know, law is a, and everybody else as well, essentially, so if law is not just the law given to us by some eternal lawgiver, but it's a product of political processes, uh, of power constellations, of historical constellations that have produced a partic particular rules for particular circumstances. And many of the more critical lawyers and legal theorists have pointed out that law is often the law of the powerful, uh, and one shouldn't assign too much legitimacy uh, to simply acting according to the law. Um, law alone doesn't tell us much about how we should act, uh, how we ought to act. Um, now, that's quite clear for, the, for questions around international law, because international law is made by states and governments of states. So you wouldn't expect them to establish rules that might invite the breakup of states. Um, it's rather sort of self-interested arguments, but it's quite, quite clear that governments have always tried to avoid any threat to stability, and only where they were absolutely forced to cede ground, they have opened up 
space for possible the revisions of the territorial landscape. Um, now, for the Spanish constitution, we have a similar situation, obviously. It's a product of the transition from dictatorship to democracy, created in a very particular historical situation with partic very particular challenges, and not the least of them being um, that there was always a threat of the forces of the Francoist status quo uh, to take on the reins more powerfully, and the 1981 coup, military coup, obviously showed that there was a real threat uh, in the late 1970s for that to happen. So obviously a constitution made under such circumstances is one that with a few decades uh, of distance one might look at rather differently. Um, and anyway, one wants to ask what a constitution that has been shaped 35, 36 years ago, how much weight should it have for us anyway? Thomas Jefferson, uh, one of the founding fathers of the US Constitution, um, argued very forcefully at the founding of the US when the sort of the, the US Constitution was made, um, that there was no reason why a future generation should be bound by that original, original document. Um, that in fact, every 20 years, you should have a new re constitution that reflects what people think now uh, and doesn't hold them hostage in, uh, in something that so their forefathers, essentially, so generations were shorter then, uh, had created. Now, the US Constitution, obviously, uh, is still there with relatively few amendments uh, since, since its founding. Um, but there's a powerful argument, obviously, there, and it's not easy to counter that. Now, the question is, of course, even more so in multinational states, the more diversity you have in a country, the less a constitution will reflect the values and standards of all parts of that, uh, of that country. Uh, and, the, and the more you need to kind of engage those different parts in the constant process of gaining allegiance to the overall order. Uh, in Canada and the UK, in a sense, the path to address that has been a very openly political one, to say, well, so we need to engage and we need to campaign for Quebec or Scotland to remain part of the overall country. Uh, so questions there weren't brushed off with an argument, at least sort of in Canada after a certain point, with the argument that this was all illegal. Um, instead, there was a political dialogue going on and an acknowledgement that um, the parts of the country should be able to have a voice on how the country as a whole should be shaped and whether they should be part of that. So I don't want to take for too much time and I'm not going to talk too much about legitimacy and democracy because I know uh, Klaus Jürgen is going to talk more about that and with much more background, uh, really. Um, I just want, to, just want to say that in many ways, once one has gotten to the question, uh, to the point where we've arrived at now, sort of, to say, well, sort of, maybe we want to look at the law with a certain degree of suspicion. Um, obviously, the space has opened up for many more questions about legitimacy, democracy, um, how should we interpret the possibilities of shaping the boundaries of one's own polity, which, if one takes democracy seriously, should somehow enter the picture. Uh, one needn't go all the way to say that this democracy will always give a right to unilateral independence in all kinds of circumstances. But at least it's probably going to give us an argument for, uh, for creating voice uh, in all the constituent parts of a, uh, of a country. It will also possibly free us, and that's sort of the last thing I want to say, really, um, free us from the suspicion that everything that's going on around secession, and that's not only, of course, confined to Catalonia. Scotland, as I said, is another case. Uh, Flanders in, in Belgium is another case, and there are going to be quite a few more, uh, probably if one opens up the question a little bit more. That all this is really sort of return of early 20th century sort of tribalism, separatism, and the like. Um, some sort of supposedly or sort of self styled enlightenment defenders have made that argument and said, well, so, so this is a thing of the past. What we need to do is really transcend borders. We should all go sort of uh, especially in Europe, we should think that the state is becoming less important and, uh, and to think that we should want to create more and more small states is really retrograde. So I think really this misses quite a bit of the point. Um, it's all nice 
I mean, the first, I think it's in many ways, though, the current movements are very different from the ones in the early 20th century. And so, uh, but it's all very nice to say that the state is losing importance, and of course it is, but still it's probably the by far most important frame of political action that we retain. Uh, and so to dismiss, the, to dismiss claims to statehood outright to say, well, this, they don't matter anymore is obviously a bit early, to say the least. And on the other hand, in Europe, it's just not as important anymore to have a big state, to have big states in general. Many of the functions that big states fulfilled for long were, uh, are taken over by the European Union. Um, and in that sense, you, one doesn't need really sort of the big multinational states uh, that provided public goods and defense and all that uh, as much anymore. Um, so that's only to say that maybe we shouldn't jump too easily to conclusions about the right size and shape of countries in Europe. And maybe actually sort of a, great, a greater number of smaller countries would help the European Union uh, quite a bit in the end. Um, certainly, it won't be an answer to say to structural minorities within existing states that, well, you've got to deal with the disciplines that those states impose on you. I think the, the allegiance that they're asked to show uh, has to be earned and argued for rather than taken for granted. And certainly, uh, one always has to come up with an answer why a particular group should form part of a particular state in a particular constitutional order. All right, I leave it at that. I've already taken up more time than I actually wanted, but so, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, and the microphone and the word, <laughs> Mr. Nagel. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for inviting me here uh, to talk with you about these issues of law and legitimacy. Uh, I'm talking more, I'll be talking more about leg legitimacy because I'm no lawyer, I'm a political scientist. Uh, for political scientists, uh, and as we have seen also for clever lawyers, uh, the law is only one source of power. Of course, political scientists, we all deal with power, uh, but power has, uh, may have different resources. Uh, the law, to have a title of law, is to have certain power, at least in liberal democracies of some kind, but uh, on the other hand, there are other sources of power, votes, finance, knowledge, maybe some more. No? And political scientists try to deal with all these uh, uh, sources of power. Now, uh, you all have seen no, the results of this uh, unofficial vote uh, on November 9th, when uh, 1.8 1. million of uh, people uh, went to the urns uh, and said yes, yes. And in total, there were 2,300,000 2, that participated in such a, uh, an unofficial uh, consultation. Uh, is that much or is that uh, not much? You all have followed the discussion on that. I mean, in absolute numbers, it's more or less what the sovereignist parties have brought to the urns in official uh, elections in 2012, a bit more. Of course, we may discuss, of course, the difference of census, but more or less it is uh, the same number. Uh, and uh, in these elections, 2012, the sovereignist parties won an absolute majority of the seats in the Catalan uh, parliament. So it all depends, as always, on participation. But anyway, uh, I would think it's kind of unfair to say that all those that went not to the urns were saying no. Uh, I think that is quite a, uh, quite, uh, unfair, an unfair manner to judge that. Uh, I mean, these urns were not meant to be the constituent act of a new state. Um, and uh, also, we have to consider that all the estimations that we have seen in the press before uh, were lower. So it was kind of uh, a success for the, those that were in favor of this consultation to take place uh, that uh, so many people participated. Um, this was not a legal referendum, not even a legal consultation, if you want. It was only an act of participation. It was uh, the last one in a row uh, of uh, millionaire manifestations in favor of having a true referendum, uh, well, one more. Uh, kind of see it kind of unfair that especially those that made the utmost that no official consultation could take place afterwards say, oh, but that's not enough. So kind of uh, 
uh, unfair argument, I would call it. Well, it is for me obvious that independence will not be legal in Spain. Uh, how could you really expect that to be so? Uh, Nico already gave a, a hint on that. I mean, uh, if you look into constitutions that concede a right uh, to secession, uh, I, I think there are only two now around, Ethiopia and St. Kitts and Nevis in the Caribbean. Uh, so uh, you really cannot expect uh, that this to be found in the Constitution. It would be desirable, my point of view, to have it there in order to have a legal uh, procedure. I prefer legal procedures to others, uh, but uh, I'm not saying that only uh, things that are in the law uh, are legitimately taking place. I mean, you could argue about Switzerland because they have a kind of procedure set up for inner secession could be used for outer, or you could argue, uh, some argue in the kind of Quebec, you mentioned the, uh, in Quebec we had two referendum uh, on sovereignty association, very complicated questions, in 1918, 1995. Uh, but Quebec was left to vote. The Canadian uh, Federation did not interfere with that. The Quebecans, the Quebecois, the Quebecers just did it. Uh, and uh, afterwards, it was the government asking the court an opinion, and the old court, uh, a constitutional court, that said, well, there's no right to secede, neither in international law nor in the Canadian constitution. But as we are liberal democrats in a federal state, if there is a clear answer on a clear question uh, saying yes to uh, independence, then we would ha they have, would have a title to negotiate, a title to negotiate, not a title to get uh, independence, but a title to negotiate with the federal government. The federal government couldn't just say, uh, then according to these principles, not the wording of the constitution, the principles uh, could not just say, well, we, you, you are not allowed to do, not even to consult, you are not allowed, allowed to do that. No? So, well, that is the, uh, uh, was the Canadian point of view, and you could argue Northern Ireland or others, but I mean, I wouldn't really expect uh, constitutions in most of our states to settle that. I would find it desirable in those multinational states that have such situations. In Spain, of course, you said the constitution could have, be, could have uh, changed, would have been changed, uh, like in Britain, that was what the British did, no? when the Scottish nationalists won their elections, uh, said, well, there's a sign of legitimacy. You won the elections with a program uh, promising a referendum. Now the Scottish people have voted you. Now now you have a kind of uh, democratic uh, title there to ask for such a vote, and then the uh, British Parliament uh, let them have their vote, changing the British Constitution. Of course, that's in uh, Britain is not uh, is much easier than in Spain, but I mean it could have been done in Spain. It could be done as well when Spain adapted to the. Uh, debt rules of the European Union. It was done in a clock. In a moment, they changed the Spanish constitution because the two parties, the two major parties wanted it. And with the two major Spanish uh, parties, you could, of course, change the constitution. Yes, but not only with one. So if one of the major Spanish parties says, well, we're going to, choose to, to, to change the constitution, everybody knows, hey, you can't. You need the other one. You need the other big party. And the other big party says, no, we won't do it. So, so what? No, even you might, from from the point of view of a Catalan, you might find it cynical then to promise that because everybody knows that it is cannot take place without the uh, uh, without uh, the second uh, party. And I'm not talking whether the first party is men, the, the ones that say they are federal. Uh, is talking in earnest because they, when they were in government, they did not do, didn't do anything to bring uh, uh, forward a federal reform of the constitution. Now they may have changed opinion, maybe. But we all know the second party will be necessary. And the second party does not want. The Catalans are not necessary. They could vote 100% uh, in favor of the uh, change of the Spanish constitution or against. That does not matter. There's no matter of that. It's a pretty, uh, the problem in a, in a multinational sta uh, state like, like Spain. But if there would be a political will, you could change the Spanish constitution, introducing a right to secede or whatever. But there is not a political will of those that have to do that. Uh, uh, and they won't, I think. Of course, you can also say, uh, and we interpret the Spanish constitution uh, for example, in the question of handing down uh, the competence of a uh, referendum that was in April this year, what the, what the Catalan Parliament asked for. Uh, well, let's interpret the Constitution in a way that uh, the 
Constitution is talking of, uh, well, we may hand down the competence of uh, celebrating a consultation or a referendum even then in April 2014. Uh, of course, if no one, if there would have been the political will in Spain to do that, they could have done that, because if no one goes to the Constitutional Court, the Constitutional Court doesn't say anything about it. No? So if, they both, uh, if, if the Spanish majority, uh, Spanish parliament would have wanted it, uh, we would already have had a, an official uh, a referendum in, in uh, Catalonia. Okay, so uh, I'm not talking much more about this, uh, of, about the law. Nico has already done that, only just these points in order, because I may uh, favor the discussion. I'm talking about legitimacy, of course. Uh, if there is no uh, legal uh, base, neither in the Constitution nor in international law, uh, there may be as well situation when secession is legitimate. Of course, there are those that say, no, nothing which is not legal is uh, legitimate. But let's put them aside for a moment. No? And in political science, of course, we have many theorists that have uh, developed theories of secession, uh, developing arguments on when secession might be legitimate in order to kind of Perhaps in the future, there will be an international law integrating these principles. Now there's not, but at least let's think about it on the morality uh, of secession. And this has been discussed. And I mean, there are those that say, well, you may be, it may be legitimate if you have a just cause. What may be a just cause? I mean, it may be uh, that you have already had independence. Someone took it away from you. You got it back, the Baltic states. Uh, by the Hitler-Stalin uh, pact, they were uh, made part of the Soviet Union, so they were independent before. Now, after, uh, uh, in the course of the breakdown of the Soviet Union, they got back what they already had, remedial right. So secession is all right then. Or well, people say, but that's the case of Catalonia, unless you say that it was a kind of independent before 1714, and that's quite a lot of time away, you know? Uh, or that those that, hey, well, when there is physical extermination or at least the menace of it, the threat, genocide, then it may be legitimate. The Kurds in Iraq, uh, when they were bombarded with gas by Saddam Hussein, a former dictator, then people said, well, to go then, uh, to want to go away from the state that is bombarding you with gas, uh, that is legitimate, even if there is no title in national or international uh, uh, law to allow you to secede. Uh, or, of course, the U.S. state, the U.S. were part of the British Empire, and they seceded uh, by war, of course, uh, from the British Empire, with the, uh, uh, arguing that they uh, were taxed but not represented. No taxation without representation. So if you are exploited in this way, uh, you are not in the parliament that taxes you. Uh, so then it uh, could be an argument. And some, some other people argue that cultural repression may also be such a just cause. I mean, uh, when I read my own press, my German press at home, which are uh, probably in Europe the most reluctant uh, uh, in, the, uh, in order to give support to the Catalan demands. Uh, British or US papers are kind of more open to that. Uh, German press always said, well, it's not legitimate. They argue there's no just cause. They don't know that they're arguing. So they don't argue in that political science terms, no? But as it kind of comes out that as there's no blood running in the streets of Barcelona and uh, that you're allowed to speak Catalan even officially inside your region, not in Madrid Parliament, but inside your region, you're allowed to do that in an official way. So what about that? And you are, of course, you pay more uh, to the Spanish state. Yes, uh, maybe that's kind of unjust, but you are represented in the Spanish parliament. So the principle of no taxation without representation would not uh, apply. So even if those papers that kind of admit that there may be some kind of injustice there uh, because of the amount that is uh, of net paying or because of that economic solidarity is asked for but not responded by cultural so uh, solidarity, you're not allowed to speak Catalan in the Madrid parliament and so on. So these maybe there's some injustice, but they uh, usually argue that that's not an argument for secession. You can uh, remedy uh, these uh, probable injustices in other ways. On the other hand, then of course the question remains, how often do you have to ask for remedy, uh, to remedy an injustice, uh, and you get no, uh, no uh, settlement of uh, your accommodation demands uh, without creating a, a cause 
I mean, the, the just cause could also be, uh, that is the argument here, uh, that all other ways have failed. So then what you do? You have to stay, you have to always ask the same a new statute of autonomy against, uh, again, for example, or are you, after having tried by other ways, in some point, legitimate to go for secession? That's the argument in this, uh, the discussion here about the just cause question. Now, Catalans usually argue it's not a question only of just causes, it's mainly a question of right to decide, primary right, if democracy, that's the main line of argument now uh, in Catalonia, as you probably all know. No? It's the argument to say, well, if you are living in a liberal democracy, you can choose whether you want the right or the, ro or the wrong, no, the right or the left in government, you, you want a, uh, uh, can discuss constitutional issues and so on. So why not the frontiers? Well, the frontiers settled up by, uh, because some Catholic kings wanted to marry or because uh, Barcelona was conquered in 1714, have they really to be the same frontiers forever and evermore for generations, for eternity, uh, is that uh, just even when we live in, an, in a time of liberal democracy, uh, are these things that happened in the faraway past uh, binding us forever? And even the question of the Spanish Constitution, because the uh, adversaries uh, of uh, independence of Sabre. But the Catalans said yes to the Spanish Constitution uh, in 1978. Yes, they did. But of course, is that binding all generations of Catalans forever? Uh, many Catalans now living and voting were even not born in 1978. No? So there's this question of a democratic right to decide, uh, which is not based on just causes, no? which is based on uh, the will uh, to decide even these issues uh, of frontiers and of stateness. Uh, people in political science that de de defend uh, democratic right uh, to decide even on that, they usually make some restrictions. I say, well, okay, but on the other hand, the outcoming state, the new state, must be viable. It must not be a Swiss cheese territory, it must not be that it falls, it's a, uh, not able economically to survive, and it is a uh, just false prey to foreign neighbors or to multinational companies or to uh, drug traders or so on. And I remember that many, many small states in the third world uh, have these problems, no? So uh, that is the argument. You can, but not if the outcome is viable. Catalonia, but uh, Catalonia too, we can discuss that, but would be perfectly viable. Uh, and there would be you no know, Swiss cheese of enclaves. Uh, they are living together, uh, not very probable. Uh, the people say yes, uh, democratic right to decide is okay, but not if you are seceding for uh, illegitimate reasons. Say uh, the southern states of the U.S. in the 19th century, they seceded from the U.S. in order to uh, continue with slavery. So that would be kind of a secession, democratically wanted by the South, uh, no doubt on that, but uh, it was made in order to continue with an illegitimate practice uh, of slavery. Um, but who are the Catalans going to oppress? Uh, they're going to be independent. The Vaidaran, uh, this Occitan-speaking uh, corner over the Pyrenean Mountains, if there's fear on that, just give the Valderan the right to decide on itself whether it wanted to continue with uh, Catalonia or prefer to be uh, Spain in order to get the, the Spanish king uh, skiing in Valderan. So, uh, the, or, I mean, uh, of course, the Valderan might argue, well, our Occitan language, uh, perhaps we're better off in Spain, not very plausible, but uh, maybe they argue that why, no? So then you could say, well, secession is legitimate, but not if you don't permit the Valderan to secession it on its own uh, terms if the Vaidaran wants so. Or people say, well, maybe the Castilian speakers they will be oppressed in an independent Catalonia, and therefore the secession should not be uh, considered legitimate, because then those uh, Catalans, uh, 
that are also Catalan speakers, uh, would oppress the Castilian uh, minority. Well, they are not the minority, I think, now. The, uh, uh, the most uh, common uh, mother tongue of Catalans now is Castilian, and all uh, independentists know that without any Castilian-speaking Catalan voters, they would never get independence. So, uh, therefore, they always uh, uh, guarantee that a uh, Castilian would be also an official language in independent Catalonia. And I think that may be asked even uh, in these terms of the discussion that to be so. Uh, there's so people that say, well, democratic right of decide is okay, but uh, no secession uh, should be permitted if the rest of the state is left in an untenable situation. I mean, I'm German, the Sudeten part of Czechoslovakia uh, on its own will uh, seceded from Czechoslovakia in 1938. By that, the military fortresses, fortresses of the Czechoslovakian state were taken away from Czechoslovakia, and a few months afterwards, Hitler could invade the rest of uh, Czechia and incorporate the rest into the uh, German territory. So there won't be the secession of these zones then could be said to be illegitimate because it left the rest of the state defenseless against the foreign aggressor. But can you really argue such a thing in the Catalan case? I think you cannot. Uh, even so with the economic viability, I mean the secession uh, of Catalonia probably would be more hard for the rest of Spain than for Catalonia itself. But is not leaving the rest of Spain in an untenable situation, not taking the oil away of it uh, like it would have even happened in the Scottish case, not even that. I mean, there's not, no, no real uh, essential resources uh, that would be taken away uh, from Spain. Uh, like in Eritrea, when it seceded from Ethiopia, Ethiopia had no harbor left. And the uh, uh, first thing the newly independent uh, Eritreans did was to put high uh, uh, fees on the use of their harbors uh, uh, for the Ethiopians. So they must say, well, you cannot secede in order to oppress the rest of state, uh, but I think uh, that there are some harbors to be left uh, for Spain. So what I am arguing is that, or even culturally, uh, people say, well, Kosovo cannot secede from, from, from Serbia because the essential cultural places for the Serbian nations are on Kosovan soil but uh, the secession of Catalonia would leave Covadonga to Spain. So it is not really taking away any essential uh, place for the uh, continuing uh, Spanish nation. So I think these arguments here that, are, that I can understand in a way that are kind of uh, limiting a democratic right of, uh, to decide because they consider uh, what, hap what will happen with the left of states. And I, sh I think we should consider that, but uh, I cannot really think that they are uh, here, uh, applicable to the Catalan case. I'm coming to the end because I'm also, I'm also uh, over uh, taking too much time. Uh, what I think is an independent Catalonia would be just more in liberal democracy, just one more, like uh, like the other states of the EU, demographically a bit bigger than the average, but what net payer to. To, to the EU, it's present, it's not the past, it's not an ethnic, ethnical clean nation state or whatever is created here. It is a, just like others, not better, uh, not worse. Um, now the thing is, what means can we play? That's an expression. Legitimacy also depends on the, on the means, at least in political theory, that you apply. I mean, uh, if uh, violence is applied or that would disqualify eventually a legitimate claim because it's using uh, illegitimate means to achieve uh, a goal that may be perfectly legitimate, but if you use legitimate uh, means to, uh, to get it, you may be on the wrong side, morally speaking. Uh, other thing that and thing that is, uh, has to do with that is, of course, the rent, uh, what do we do? How do we do we establish uh, independence then? Um, if no referendum is allowed, and that was what the what the uh, you alluded to, you no, know, the mass uh, speech and the way to well, as we are not allowed a referendum, we have to go by. Uh, elections and the arguing whether uh, these elections then in the end will bring uh, the possibility of voting because in the end there will always be a vote. Catalonia is, and that's my last uh, argument here, Catalonia is unique normally, it's not unique to get a new state. I mean how many states were there in Europe before the First World War? About 12. And now we have only in the EU we have 28. 
to get new states in Europe or in the world. It is not an exception. But normally the new states got, uh, were uh, into existence, came into existence by war, defeat of the, of the first state, or by agreement, like when the Swedes conceded the Norwegians to vote, uh, or in the case that Scotland would have uh, won its independence, uh, then uh, it would have been because the British led them. Uh, or, uh, or they come uh, by dissolution of federations like Czechoslovakia, specifically dissolving because both of the uh, federated states agreed on that. It's not the case of Catalonia. Catalonia, there is no war, and the Spain would have entered would have entered the First World War on the side of the Germans. Uh, Catalonia would probably be now independent, as so many other places in, in Europe. Uh, that's a matter of course for me. But Spain did not, and Spain is not going to concede uh, uh, the vote like the Swedish uh, did in the case of Norwegians. Uh, like, and there's no title in the Constitution as in the case of the Montenegros, uh, Montenegro when it went to independence. So it is unique in the sense that it has to uh, go its own way because Spain is not going to lose a war. Uh, Spain's economic crisis is not going to be as hard uh, as there will be a total dissolution of the Spanish state. Uh, there is no, uh, no title in the constitution. There is no title in international law. Uh, so Catalonia has to do it in a liberal democratic way on its own. And that makes it unique. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, what we heard was very interesting, and I'm very sure that there will be questions from the audience. Um, yeah, please feel free to ask for the microphone. Oh, yeah, well, then you. Yeah. Um, this is a question for both, um, both speakers. Huh? I've recently been watching uh, the, the Catalan media judge, con Congress by the Catalan media judge. Santiago with our quite a lot on YouTube. Uh, basically, uh, I'm interested in how uh, how a possible future constitution might look. Um, but one of the things he's mentioned on both uh, in both conferences that I've seen um, is in the case that Catalonia got a democratic mandate. He doesn't specific, specify how, but it looks like it's going to be over three over three elections and Spain refused to negotiate the secession. Um, in both cases, he's implied that international mediators would, would definitely come in. Um, he obviously does this in a very confident way because as I think both, both of you have hinted at, um, the, the pro-Catalan, the pro-separatist, secessionist um, people tend to be a little overconfident. Um, um, but I would be interested to hear both your views on whether that's a reasonable, reasonable supposition. Yeah, um, thanks. And the question of whether there would be mediators, um, as with all mediation, always depends on whether both sides agree. Um, and uh, so in a, an event I took part in last week in Berlin, um, Somebody suggested that maybe the European Commission could play that role of a mediator. Uh, but of course, um, so first the Commission will be hesitant to do something without the direct sort of invitation by one of its member states to deal with internal, uh, internal affairs. Um, and more generally, any other international organization will be very hesitant to do so. So really, I think whether there would be mediation would, would be enti entirely dependent on the stands of the Spanish government uh, on the matter, and as long as they want to keep that a domestic affair, uh, it's going to be difficult, um, difficult to do that. Um, so if they maintain the hardline stance that they have been doing so far, saying, well, so that's illegal and we deal with it as a matter of law enforcement, um, they are going to want to grant the Catalans the legitimacy that they might have as a kind of equal negotiation or mediation partner. Right. They will want to deal with it through the courts and the, uh, and the prosecutors. Um, so, I don't know. Um, I think it's, it depends very much on how the, on the strategic assessment of the situation in Madrid, um, whether there's, there would be reasonable mediation. Um, but <coughs> it might be, if they, Madrid doesn't agree, it might simply be left to its own devices. 
while I thinking uh, that an international mediation would be plausible, uh, because there are very uh, important actors that would be interested in that. I mean, if a, there would be a, take it uh, in a scenario of a majority decision of the Catalans to go for independence, to set up in a pacific way their own state structures, uh, in this scenario, uh, I think any kind of vengeance issue from the side of the Spanish state, because they lost then uh, the uh, democratic discussion on uh, on uh, secession uh, would be um, counterproductive and disincentivized by very important actors, uh, economical actors, political actors from outside Spain, that in this case would make up their mind for a negotiated uh, solution to get an agreement uh, on the situation of Catalonia towards the EU on the assets and debts of the Spanish states and so on and so on. And there would be even the Spanish economy interested in having that. As I sometimes have already said, I cannot imagine any uh, Valencian uh, orange producer uh, being very uh, much in favor of having to cross a frontier of a non-EU state to bring the origins to the Frankfurt market. I cannot imagine, and I cannot imagine it for Ford, and I cannot imagine it for Volkswagen, and I cannot imagine it for Siemens. I really cannot imagine that to happen. I mean, I understand that they now say, well, let it, please, please let it be as it is. It's good enough for us. I can imagine that, and I will be. But situation comes up, comes up in a democratic way, uh, and in your uh, scenario, Spanish state then taking a kind of vengeance attitude. Now we veto it all. We make them get out and, bid and stay outside the EU and so on, so on, so on. We get a lot of pressure then from uh, first kind of economical actors, also political actors from other places like, that like Germany now side up with the Spanish government, but in this situation, they would, have, would, have, would perhaps think twice and look for an intermediation. Hi, um, I have two questions. The first one was what does the theme of the time end a liberal democratic process of succession look like? Because it seems like quite well identified the international law, European law, and the Spanish constitution is providing a mechanism, a democratic mechanism, legal mechanism for, for, for Catalan to leave Spain if they'd like to. Um, and then with the problems you raised about the just cause that Catalonia had to succession, they would, if, if the legal process didn't work, they wanted to resort to violence or some kind of revolution uh, <clears throat> on the streets. And, um, that would then violate any kind of just cause to be in that, as, as a new state. So I'm interested in that. And so does this conversation completely change in a year if Podemos continue being popular and Podemos uh, suddenly in government? Um, does this conversation change? Yeah. Uh, so, what would the liberal democratic process be? I mean, in a sense, I think, uh, in many ways, it would look obviously like a negotiation, right? Sort of a sort of a civilized negotiation between the different parts over potential terms of living, of staying together, or terms of uh, falling apart, right? Um, now. The difficulty with that, of course, is that you um, so you need two to to tango, um, and uh, and in a sense, I mean, so the, uh, my question also to Klaus Jürgen's previous answer um, would be sort of how far I'm sorry, how far is one of the parties able to push the other into a position where they are forced to negotiate? Um, because in a sense, I mean, there's much. I mean, I think from the central government side. There's, the idea seems to be you can you, you can you can wait it out, right? Um, and you raise the threshold so high that in the end, for the Catalans, the only way to really do it is to create facts. And facts means uh, means something that might have some, well, maybe not violent, but it is a pretty sort of practical implications, right? Taking taking over institutions, kicking. Uh, the Spanish judges out of the courthouses, right? Essentially, and sort of installing Catalan judges, 
these types of things that you would have to do in order to become an independent state uh, eventually. And they might think, well, this, they're not going to do it in the end. Right? So this will seem too brutal, seem too rough, and they might not do it. So uh, in a sense, I think there's a, so this is, a, this is going to be for long, uh, sort of a mutual game of chicken, in a sense, sort of. Who, who is going to check out first, right? Who's going to uh, who's going to give in uh, to the threats of the others, and how far is the other one going to be able to push it? Um, so that doesn't sound overly liberal and democratic, uh, but I think so. In the current stalemate, I I think this will it will take a while to solve itself up to that point, and I'd hope that this goes without violence. At the same time, my sense is that indeed, sort of, the further this goes on, um, the more we get to a, to a likely situation where external actors and also internal actors are indeed interested in uh, in a negotiated solution and will push for it. Um, now, my sense is that so there's increasing um, sort of concern in other places. In Germany, certainly, I see this um, that something unstable is going to develop here, um, and people don't know much about Catalonia, uh, but they see well. So this seems to be getting getting hot. And this they don't want, obviously, so within the European Union they don't want. Sort of when they get to the point where they think that instability is too much to tolerate and they want to push the Spanish government to sell, so okay, now you have to sit on the table and you really have to, to talk to the other side. Uh, and if that is at a point where the Catalans are still are, are ready to talk, hmm, or whether they've gotten to a point where where point of no return, um, I don't know. I think it's uh, this is a it's still quite a bit quite a bit ahead so far. I don't think that the sensitivity in the rest of Europe is that great that they would pressure the Spanish government a great deal um, if the Catalans were about to actually create facts and effectively govern the country. The situation is going to change, right? So there's going to be a tipping point at some point where everybody's going to be interested in if it's happening anyway, creating a a way in which it is happen, going to happen civil, in a civilized manner. But to get to the position where it might happen anyway uh, sort of is, is not an easy one. Podemos may change a lot. Um, now, Podemos is not, is not likely to be to gain an absolute majority. And we have nobody, I think, has any clue where Podemos is going to be in the polls in a year from now. Um, most likely, it's going to be some form of coalition government because nobody's going to have an absolute majority or anything close to it probably next time around. Um, so there might be, uh, and there's going to be a change in this, if Podemos is, would, were part of the government, um, there would obviously be more willingness um, either to allow sort of a referendum, um, which a simple majority could do, uh, but of course uh, there, might, there might also be greater openness to changing the constitution, but uh, as Kazuyan has rightly pointed out, right, sort of changing the constitution is a is a very difficult affair without the support of the PP. And any realistic offer uh, of doing that without the uh, without the PP is uh, is going to be is going to be very difficult to achieve. Um, and the PP has a strong strategic interest in not giving in and sort of strengthening its base. So unless they come around, I don't think that that much, which I mean, there's obviously going to be more talking and and sort of sympathies on both sides, I guess. But um, but the but, but the fundamental difficulties will not be going to be solved easily. Uh, as you all know, we are going into an election, a year of elections in 2015. We will have municipal elections, uh, elections in most of the autonomous communities in Spain. We will in the end have Spanish statewide parliament elections and pro perhaps we will even have Catalan elections. In terms of elections, everybody thinks about who's uh, going to win. And of course, the central government, that means that is probably hard on the Catalan question as well, because the, uh, in a economic, uh, the economy is not doing as well as often said. And uh, the uh, polls say that the uh, absolute majority will probably not repeat, um, things like that. 
No? So in the at least be hard on the Catalans to get your forces together, I think I would call that, because the Spanish government in, the, in uh, its position on the Catalan question has the Spanish political opinion, the Spanish opposition uh, behind it, and the majority of the Spaniards living outside Catalonia are also agreeing, according to polls, with the position of the uh, Spanish government. So, of course, there's then a strong incentive for the Spanish government to continue the conflictive course that it has uh, steered, and to, let's say, whether we can uh, uh, sit it out in that without having to uh, negotiate or to give anything or any point of our position away. Uh, wait, then, uh, uh, therefore, I think the conflict is going to continue uh, unless the Catalans divide. That would, of course, uh, solve uh, the problem for the uh, central government, or unless they act, and then they, the Spanish government will have to decide whether taking a, 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 getting into a reasonable uh, negotiating position or whether to get into the vengeance uh, dim dimension that, to my mind, could bring in uh, international community. Uh, uh, someone, you were asking about the party political, I think even Podemos, no? Okay, Podemos is of course a new factor that nobody knows exactly what it will mean and it's now high in the in the polls and may go lower in the future. We know nobody, I don't have a crystal ball, uh, cannot uh, uh, a real reasonable make any prophecy about that. Um, I think Podemos, according to its principles, should be in favor of a democratic right to decide. And some, and sometimes uh, people there have uh, talked in this direction. On the other hand, uh, Pablo Iglesias also said that he was a defender of the Spanish sovereignty. Of course, against the uh, Troika, EU uh, interference, and so on. So on, and uh, all the, the leading people in uh, Podemos, they come from Universidad Complutense, many of them with a Marxist background. Uh, uh, according to polls, uh, only 20% of their sympath sympathizers in Catalonia would vote yes, yes. So I cannot really uh, put them uh, on the side of those that would not only stand for a referendum but also for independence, vote for independence if the question be put in a, uh, in a, in a referendum. Uh, I think that uh, in the end they may prob probably come out um, as quite centralist uh, uh, guys in the look of solutions uh, for the economic pro uh, problems of Spain if they ever come into a position to co-decide that. Um, so in the issue, in spite of their uh, theoretical stance on being in favor of a base uh, bottom-up democracy and even to vote on independence, uh, they will not be a very active factor. Is it, I think it's a topic that is for them quite incommodate. Uh, politically speaking. It's not, therefore, they put it always uh, aside and talk in the first stance about economy and other problems where they feel uh, to have uh, a say. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, I have one question to you, Mr. Nagel. Um, well, I have my voice is <laughs> I have one question to you, Mr. Nagel, which is uh, there are voices who said that the actual autonomous status for Catalonia is in several terms more than uh, in a federal state what they would have been in. Uh, Uh, and as I don't know these facts, perhaps you can explain us a little bit more about, uh, in, in comparison with the, with the federal state, perhaps like Germany, as an example, because there are several ones now, uh, could you tell us what is Catalonia, where do they have more rights and more, that, more autonomous status, and in which questions they don't? This is one question which I have, just to think about an alternative. You know, uh, mm -hmm. this is my second uh, opinion, perhaps, no? or commentary. Uh, where is the alternative to the independency, which is something which uh, search for a confrontation? We are seeing a confrontation, or we see a division of a society inside of the families, inside of the tables, inside of 
companies, we have division, and we are, we are, we get forced into a division, which is very uncomfortable. And when you look to the past and the histories, we have seen a lot of conflicts because of those type of uh, being pushed into black or white. And I think it's not the time. We are in Europe. We are living together. When you look from outside of of Spain to this conflict, to this question, I'm living here for more than 15 years, uh, I see there's, we are not so different. There are differences between the South, the North, the Basque, the Catalans, the Central Spanish people. But when you look from outside, the, big, the difference is not so big. There are much more big difference between other countries where we really have different cultures and religions. And here we have small differences. And it's a question, from my point of view, it's a, it's a question of playing with who gets more power, etc., and who gets more money. In effect. So my question is, is there a will to look for an alternative, which means working for a federal state, and ask to change the constitution with a sense of creating a federal state but sticking together. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Nagel? Yeah, thank you. The uh, first question was on a comparison between an autonomous community and the member states of a federation. Yeah, how you measure who has more power uh, depends because uh, several issues at stake. How secure is your position? Scotland has a lot of autonomy, but it could be taken by a simple majority of the Westminster Parliament. So in this issue, it is not the power that it has may not be very high. On the other hand, it has many competences in many issues. How would you weight that? There's a third factor, especially according in federal states. In federal states, federation is defined by uh, self-rule and shared rule. You may have a lot of self-rule, but not share the rule of the overall federation, or the reverse. Austrian member states have a lot of a high role in the shared rule of the overall federation of Austria, but not much self-rule. So however you value that, how much many points do you give for the security of your autonomy, constitutional only by law, things like that, to the uh, self-ruling capacity and to the capacity to share the overall rule of the general state. It's difficult. Yeah, I mean, there are several propositions uh, by comparative uh, 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 political scientists working in comparative, comparative way to give points, to say, well, I give so many points for uh, security of your competences uh, that you cannot be taken away by a court or by uh, uh, um, uh, framing laws, uh, leyes organicas or whatever. How secure, that's one. How many points you give to that? Then. How much for your autonomy and inside autonomy? Is it more important to have a say, but only a co-say in many issues, as the autonomous community of Spain have? Or is it important to have a last word, a kind of sovereignty, a last word in any issue there? The uh, autonomous communities would be weak. How, how do you point that? No? How, how, do you, how many points do you give on thing? And essential. In a federation, you have a co-rule uh, by a second chamber, the same value as the third, or uh, by a, an influence on the arbiter, the constitutional court, uh, so uh, that you feel secure and that you have a, a voice in the in the share, a share in the overall ruling. And there is where the autonomous communities are very, very weak, as you know. So autonomous communities have a lot of different competences, but nearly in no issue, they have the last word. So much for the self-rule. Uh, their security of competences depends on the Spanish constitution, but it's not, they have no constitution of their own. Uh, constitutional courts sometimes say, well, your statutes of autonomy are part of a constitutional block, but with the last sentence on the, on the Catalan would-be statute that had been put into question, security is uh, not as high as in other, as in real federations, where uh, uh, the security is higher. So it, it is difficult to compare an autonomous state, uh, as you see. Uh, 
Probably autonomous communities have a more a wider range of competences uh, than uh, many German uh, than German lender. But German lender in some issues have a last word that uh, autonomous communities not, do not have. And German lender are very strong and getting stronger. He have gotten stronger in their role in the overall federation. So much for the comparison. Per Probably uh, you have to consider as well that Spain is a multinational state, Germany is not. Uh, so to have an, a federal arrangement in itself does not solve uh, a national question. It may even be a nationalizing device in the, for the sake of the overall nation of the general state. I mean, uh, you got a uh, federal state, but you're one of 17. Uh, you got a strong second chamber, the, all, all the other 16 or at least 15 vote continue, continuously against your issues, for example, no? For the sake of an example. So what do you want? You have the same problem in the first chamber. So you get only a repetition of that, and if you don't get a, additional devices, asymmetric devices, or veto rights, or a double pact, or whatever, I can imagine other things, uh, then a federation in itself does not solve a problem of the accommodation of a, a minority nation. It, I mean, uh, federalizing Sp uh, Switzerland or federalizing the US was a national project of the Swiss nation or of the US nation, not of uh, any other nations. It was done for that. No? Uh, so uh, for me, a federation in itself is not uh, necessarily a solution uh, for a situation of a plurinational state. Uh, a second question was on, well, uh, the problem of dividing. Why should we divide? Of course, family, you mentioned, of course, there are divorces. Uh, divorce is sometimes uh, the best uh, solution available for one of the parts, or for the other part, or even for both parts. Uh, you may doubt that Catalonia and Spain were married in 1714 by a, a pact the way that England and Scotland were uh, uh, made a union in 1707. You may doubt that, but that's history, no? I mean, I'm not uh, a, uh, a, a divorce uh, may be sometimes uh, the best solution as well. Uh, I'm sure that I... Uh, if the statute issue wouldn't have happened, if the statute wouldn't have been widely declared un unconstitutional in 2010, after having been voted by uh, the Catalan people in a referendum, then we wouldn't be where we are. Then we wouldn't have this strong independentist uh, movement. Uh, whether they win or not they win, that's another question, but it wouldn't be as strong, and I can't prove it when you look into the polls and asking uh, the, uh, the old polls and uh, we're asking the people what you want, uh, independence, a federal state, autonomous community, or being a region of a unitary state. Then uh, before 2006, say, it was 10, 12 perhaps percent of the Catalans saying independence, and now you get higher than 40 uh, according to which a poll you believe more, most. No? So something happened there. And if it wouldn't have happened, all the statute discussions, seven years or six years and a half, uh, discussing on a statute which came to nothing, at least in the, in the perception of uh, so many Catalans, so then it wouldn't have happened. Even afterwards, if a financial pact with the first alternative and the statute failed of Convergencia was not to go for a referendum on independence, the first alternative was, now let's go for a fiscal pact. But very clearly and very quickly, the Spanish government made it clear that a fiscal pact wouldn't have been got, couldn't be got. So then, after these other alternatives, non-secessionist alternatives, had failed, at least in the perception of so many Catalans, then what else? Go to all that again. Is that believable? Will the... Uh, constitutional uh, change include an accommodation uh, for the Catalan nation now, when it has not done so, when the party that is now proposing that did not do so in the past, and when many people of that party are uh, telling us that they are not going to go have an asymmetric federation, but only a symmetric German way. So uh, I cannot really, it, I mean, it, it, you cannot, it's not a computer history, and you can reset it. Let's reset it to 2003. Can't do that, I think. Um, yeah. I, 
I mean, I find your sensitivity is so about the division and the, the friction. Um, I mean, also share, I'm kind of uneasy about it, it's just sort of, I've been on and off in sort of essentially here more or less since ten, about 10 years ago. And things have changed a lot, indeed. Now, at the same time, I think, indeed, so there was a long phase where Catalans were perfectly ready um, to go for some kind of federal arrangement, sort of some change in the direction of a federal system. They've been rebuked time and again, right? And, they, and I think after doing this for a few decades, you essentially say, well, so well, if the other one doesn't want to do it, why would I keep going at the same thing? And indeed, sort of, if there's no uh, if there's no serious sign of willingness, sort of a, a sincere, credible signal from the other side that they that they mean it, I wouldn't understand. I wouldn't see why why you would think that the other side is going to change their mind. Unlikely, right? So that they're going to act differently, like in a divorce, right? So unless you see that the other one is going to act differently than he or she has acted the last 20 years, you're not going to believe it. You simply say, well, so I'm not going to trust another five, ten years of my life. Uh, to to keep going in a marriage that now isn't working and is unlikely to work again. So so I think I think the problem is not really one of the absolute difference, as you put it. So are they so different? No, they're not. But most of it is about the perception of difference and perception of the ability to live together. The Swiss are sort of probably objectively, in terms of language and other things, much further apart than most countries and still they are together, they have been together for several hundred years because they have found a way of living together and accepting these differences and working them out in a civilized way. Right? The US arms for long wouldn't have been seen to be that different, but they reached a point where they had the feeling that because of the acrimony that built up in the relations between the different republics within Yugoslavia, they couldn't go on together anymore. Right? So where some parts of the the Yugos are served, it's actually overstretched. The position and the other said, no, 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 we, we don't want this anymore. Right? Before that, many people tell me you wouldn't have seen the difference between them. There was lots of financial marriages and, and all that. Once the conflict had broken out, the difference is very enormous. And that's a matter of perception. These things, these things can change, I think, very quickly. And here they have indeed changed, I think, very heavily since the, uh, since the episode of the Statut. Um, and indeed, so that psychology is is a thing that's going to stick quite heavily, uh, and it's difficult to overcome without sort of major moves um, moves on on both sides. And I think so to add to this, and what we see now, we had a government of the PP for several years that has had a very strong recentralizing urge in economic policy, in fiscal policy, in educational policy, right, and pretty much any area of policy that you can think of. There's been a recentralization rather than a further devolution or decentralization that you would have expected maybe as a form of accommodation. Nothing of it. Right? Would you think that that kind of party would agree to a constitutional reform that requires the PP to agree? I would certainly have doubts. Perhaps I would like to answer on, on two details. Um, one thing is, when, when we had the negotiation about the statute, uh, there were a proposal from the government uh, brought to the, to the special, Spanish government and then to the parliament as well. And uh, when, the, when the socialists were in power, they said yes to that proposal. Am I right, historically? Uh, because I lived here and Not I at that time. Uh, there were two questions which were felt like a two big provocations. One thing is to say Catalonia is a nation, and the other where, if I am right, you can correct me, uh, the question about how many weight we should give on one language or the other language. I don't remember 100% if that was right, but, but I remember something like that. So there were some themes inside of this proposal about the change of the statute, which when I put myself into the skin of the central power, I couldn't have, I couldn't give a, a yes to that question because that means the beginning of a final division. So I think, from my point of view, part of this, uh, I don't know the word in here, fracaso, what is fracaso? Failure. Failure. 
uh, has been because they ask for too much. Okay, we'll answer no, this really? question and then uh, we're, we're up with our time, so let's... Uh, mm -hmm. let's yeah, thank you. Uh, before coming to the last question now, uh, I think it's very, very important to, to, to have clear that it's not a question of absolute differences. I mean, uh, whether people eat the same thing or dress the same thing, or uh, that's, that's not the issue here. I mean, uh, uh, no, Catalans surely uh, had another dress uh, than Madrid people uh, in the 19th century, and there was no secessionism then. Uh, nobody is wearing a baratina anymore uh, today. Uh, today we are all more or less dressing the same and buying the same goods in the supermarkets. Uh, in the 19th century, more people spoke only Catalan. Nobody is speaking only Catalan today, uh, uh, at least not in Spain. Uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, so uh, the absolute difference is in Quebec the same. In the 50s, when there was no Quebec uh, Nationalist Party, uh, Quebecers, according to polls, had very terrible opinions on uh, social values, the role of the of the uh, uh, of the women, and things like that. Very different to other Canadians, not more progressive, but on the contrary, now they are now they having the same uh, system of values, but now they have Quebec nationalism. Uh, a strong one in a party, and they have voted uh, twice on the sovereignty association and, and, and nearly won, uh, at least in the second time. Well, it's not the question of uh, 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 absolute differences, uh, and only to strengthen Nico's point. A reverse, uh, can independentism re be reversed? That is a question that I sometimes ask myself, because you could argue, if it comes up so quickly, uh, from 10, 15 percent up to 40, 50 percent in so few years, uh, so, can, can that go back? Can that fall back? And my answer, I, 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 of course I'm not a, a, the only one who tries to give an answer to that, would be no, why not? Because now we have a new uh, configuration of parties. We have a movement in, on the streets. We have young leaders that have uh, uh, installed themselves in the political system. And by their own interest, they will not, uh, neither the movement nor the young leaders in the parties would go back to a uh, situation before. So the answer here, I'm asking, uh, I'm often asking you the question, if it comes up so quickly, can it, uh, the souffle question, no? Can it uh, not uh, come down uh, as well uh, very quickly? My, my, my own answer, and you maybe may of course discuss that, is no. It cannot be redressed in the same way and with the same uh, velocity. Uh, your history of the of the statute process, okay? I remember it. I lived here already. Uh, then I'm living here now since uh, 1997, uh, 2003, when the uh, uh, socialist candidate uh, for the Spanish election, Rodriguez Zapatero, came uh, in the, to the Catalan electoral campaign and said, uh, you, if you want a new statute, huh, and you voted with an overall majority in the, in the Catalan parliament, and we socialists got majority in, in Spain, we will let it pass. Did not happen, no? Uh, what, ha what happened is the first part, 80% of the Catalan parliament agreed on a text sent this text to Madrid, and then it was shaved. Huh? It was shaved. Where was it shaved? You said it was about national recognition, for example. National recognition means nation to be in the text. In the statute uh, of the Catalan Parliament, it was in the text. It was shaved, was put into the foreword without any juridical uh, meaning. And it was then, uh, the foreword now runs as the Catalan Parliament uh, is of the opinion that uh, Catalan is a nation. Okay, that's a fact. Uh, it has uh, declared to, that Catalan is a nation since the 80s. That's not new. Uh, but it's not an accommodation. It's only a statement of a historical fact that the Catalan Parliament, majority in of the Catalan Parliament, is of this opinion. And was of this opinion already in the 80s, okay, and is of the opinion in the 90s, and is still of the same opinion. So uh, it, from national recognition, not a new demand, eh? it, it was transferred to what a uh, meaningless forward. Or you can go for the other issues in the, uh, in the statute, bilateral relations, armoring the competences against uh, interference, securing them, uh, the issues that were language, 
uh, in language that has even fallen back uh, before the statute of 1979 after the sentence of the, of the court. So the shaved statute, but then now it's, it's initial. The shaved statute was passed by Madrid Parliament. So it was not asking too much because the Madrid Parliament with the majority said now the shaved statute is okay. And then, then it was sent to the Catalan people, and the Catalan people were not so enthusiastic about it because the, not even 50% went to the urns, but in the referendum, 74% of those that went, they said yes. And afterwards, four years of deliberation, leaks, uh, which uh, articles would be not allowed, or the court would, peer, would put a rider on it with uh, obligatory interpretations sometimes, no? So you see, can I say it was asking too much of the Madrid Parliament was agreement. Uh, afterwards, the Catalan, according to the procedure established in Madrid law, uh, said yes. But then it would, uh, the perception was that it was not worth the while to have six years of negotiations because in the end the essential issues were no longer in the statute. Asking too much or ask, asking too less is always a matter of, of course, of, percep uh, of uh, perception. Uh, may also be moral arguments so, uh, at stake on that. I'm not going into this detail. But uh, as the history of the statute, which I think is essential, it's lengthy, I know, because it is seven years or nearly seven years of history. Uh, it's lengthy. And if I have to uh, explain it in Germany, I sometimes have, I have to, uh, to, uh, I have to care to be short because the people otherwise they would be sleepy. But that's, of course, the, this fatigue is one of the points. It's one of the points why afterwards uh, independentism was so strong. All right, so our time is up. Um, just to resume, I understand that uh, independence could be possible if the Catalans keep going. Uh, it seems uh, as well viable that a government that considers more the law than the legitimacy could keep saying no and could keep doing that. Uh, we'll see up to which point. What seems clear as well that the federal option is the most impossible option because that would mean that you need two players and right now it looks like none of them is on stage to do that. Cannot force another one to pact. Exactly. That uh, comes from point B. And uh, I also just want to add a small thing that I have to say that when I travel, I'm German. <clears throat> I'm very glad sometimes that I'm not Catalan because I don't have to explain who I am. I can say I'm German and nobody will question that and nobody will ask me, um, where is that? Or who are you? All right. Thank you very much. And thank you for coming tonight. And uh, thank you, all of you, for being such a great audience. And uh, yes, now, since we're Germans, we would like to continue this debate with some beers downstairs in the bar. And uh, if you're looking forward to meet us again, we're going to have our next event at the end of January, and it's most likely going to be about economics. So you can join, if you want, our meetup group on internet, um, Our Future in Catalonia. It's called, and uh, if not, we'll let you know anyway by email. So thank you again for tonight, and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.